you very much. Um, I hope you can hear me. Okay. So um, I'm very excited to be here. So I'm going to talk about uh, a problem that you know I've been working quite a bit up until about you know a few years ago. Then you know I took a little break, and now I'm slowly getting back into that. You know this is the life of academia. You know our research is very much driven you know by the funds that we get. So I didn't get money for this for a while, and now I'm slowly trying to get a little more money. Um, so today we will talk about some uh, stochastic algorithms uh, driven by machine learning. Um, if you're familiar with evolutionary algorithms or genetic algorithms in general, a lot of the terminology will be familiar to you, but you know, we will extend into machine learning reasoning, and I will try to explain everything. So hopefully by the end of this talk, um, it will all be clear to you. So I'll start talking a little bit about me. So as uh, David has said, uh, my PhD is in computational science and informatics, bachelor and master, and in computer science. I really come from the computer science part of the field. When I was in my second year of PhD, as a computer science student, I really fell in love with remote sensing data. I just happened you know, to walk into a presentation from a NASA scientist, and I said, that's really what I want to do. So I slightly switched from computer science into computational science, and that's how I got involved into the spatial field. And then from there, I started addressing uh, problems with atmospheric models and uh, recently social media. And um, the field, um, it's really called geoinformatics. It really sits at the intersection between computer science and, you know, GIS, atmospheric science, and so on. And um, I'd like to start with this. This is a very powerful slide because it says that this is a very right time in history to study geoinformatics because we have never known so much about the Earth. We have an unprecedented access to data. And I can tell you back a story you know, that tells how old I am. You know, when I was doing my PhD and I wanted to get remote sensing data, I actually had a tape shipped from Alaska because it was faster to ship a tape from Alaska than try to download that large amount of data through a regular network. And you know, the remote sensing data is exploding now. It's very, very large. But even back in the late 2000s, it was still very large. We were still talking about gigabytes. Um, and then the final one, you know, that our society is so much at risk. And those are really my passions, environmental hazards and renewable energy, um, remote sensing, numerical simulation, and social data as our uh, primary sources of data. And then those are the methods, the geoinformatics. This is really, you know, where I'm making my contribution. And those are my premises, you know, that the rate at which we are collecting data, or even generating data, if you're in the modeling world, is much larger than our ability to an analyze them. And this is really not really a new phenomenon. You know, if you go back to the very early days of the space exploration with uh, the Soviet Venera problems, or even you know, the uh, mariner problem of the US, a lot of the data has never been analyzed until very recently. You know, back in those days, you, know, you developed the, um, um, the payloads, you know, send it into space, collect the data, mission accomplished. So you know, the last part is analyzing of the data. It's something that is receiving a revival right now. And the techniques for ge geoinformatics really are borrowed from all the different fields, you know, mathematics, physics, computer science, um, and so on. So really, I would define the problem as going from data to knowledge. And let's start, you know, with some definition. First of all, raw data, it's useless, or I should say are useless. I'm sorry, it's a typo. Um, and what I mean there is that, you know, data, just data, they're just recorded information. Data are nothing else than a collection of symbols. What we want to do first is to interpret those data and those symbols, and we call that information, and then use the patterns in the information to solve a problem. We solve that knowledge. So this is the process of going from data to knowledge, those collection of symbols into something that we use to solve a problem. And here where geoinformatics algorithms you know, come into play. They can learn patterns, and um, we can use them to solve a problem. As I said earlier, the methods, they originate from different fields. I myself come from the machine learning community. That was you know, the, um, all my uh, master and PhD. Um, and then the other part of the work I do right now is geographical information systems. So you know, this is why those are highlighted. It's not that they're more important. Those are the ones that I uh, work with. So 
What does it mean to learn? Well, first of all, learning is a goal-oriented task. You know, this is really the premise of machine learning. We're not learning just because for the sake of learning, we're really learning because we're trying to solve a problem. And you know, if we are trying to solve a problem, it means that we know something about this problem. One of the, uh, the hardest problem in machine learning is that we don't really just go from data to knowledge. We go from data plus background knowledge into some new knowledge. And the problem is that this background knowledge comes in different forms, sometimes additional data. Sometimes this is the intu intuition of an analyst that has been looking at images in its entire life. So it's enough you know, to just look at an image and to say, oh, yeah, yeah, no, I think this is a, it's going to rain or not. One of the hardest things is machine learning now is to capture this background knowledge and use it in order to use new knowledge. And when we mean about learning, what are we learning? Three different things, content, organization, and certainty. Um, by the way, I'm talking about computational learning. I'm not talking about, you know, like human learning, psychological learning, just computation. We're talking about machine learning. So learning content, what does it mean? Well, you know, acquiring new data, solving in, in order to solve a new problem. You know, that's a form of learning. But then organization. Imagine you get a phone book, okay? And this phone book, it's ordered alphabetically. Well, you know, it will allow you to answer a certain number of questions. Like, for example, you want to find out the phone number of a friend of yours, you know, using a simple binary search, you will find it right away. But now, what about if you want to find out all the people that live at a certain street? See, the informations are there, but, you know, you would have to linearly go through the entire phone book. So what you can do, you can learn to reorganize it, you know, instead of alphabetically by street address, and now you know you can answer more questions. You can solve your problem. You see, you have just changed the organization of the data. That is seen as a form of learning. So reorganizing the data to solve a problem is a form of learning. And the last one, uncertainty. Again, if we go to this phone book, you know this phone book is ten years ago. Then you know your certainty is rather low. You just update it, and now you have learned just by increasing the certainty. Okay. Now in my field. Two additional meta attributes are super important, which are the spatial and temporal constraints. And those are really intricated into all those three different parts. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, evolution of machine learning. When I studied machine learning in the uh, early 2000s, uh, this was called the inferential theory of learning. It was the most important um, equations for um, you know, um, symbolic machine learning, but you know, like a decision tree, trees, decision rules, and so on. And the idea was that, you know, we have some data, we have this humongous amount of background knowledge, which come in different form, and we have to generate new knowledge. So this is, you know, what I learned. This is what, you know, I, I learned in my books. This is the word now. So, you know, that's why we call it big data. I made, you know, a very large font. <laughs> so now the problem, you know, is that this has become even larger than our background knowledge. To the point that now we have those purely data-driven approach. You know, this is something that if you go back, you know, 10, 15 years, you take a textbook, they were talking about data-driven approach, but now we really start doing it. The idea that, you know, we collect data without really an intent, we give it, you know, to a machine learning system, and then, you know, we automatically found some new uh, knowledge that we're going to use to solve problems. This is the data-driven approach. Okay, so um, as David said, I'm the associate director of the Institute of Cyber Science at Penn State. Let's define this for a moment because you know this is really transformative. If you write NSF proposals, you know that this is a good word. <laughs> so last three centuries, last three centuries since you know Galileo. Um, I mean, you know, if you are Italians like us, you know, we learn from Galileo. If you are from the Anglo-Saxon <laughs> tradition, probably Bacon. But about, you know, from the 1600s, you know, really, we had a real big change in the way we do science. You know, we start from observations. You know, up until, you know, the time of Galileo, really, you know, the, the observations of the real world were limited. You know, it was one of the first scientists that really started making systematic observations and drive inference from those observations. And really, for the last, you know, about three centuries, 300 years, most of our science come from that, you know, making observation, developing a theory, and then testing it. In the last three decades, about 30 years ago, you know, we added this computational and data-enabled research. Um, we gave it a name about 10 years ago, cyber science or geoinformatics. 
Um, it has really revolutionized the way we do science. And you see, this is the key word. It's been transformative. And uh, I didn't have it here in this presentation because you know I'm trying to save a little bit of time and show you more scientific result. But if you look, if you go on Google and you do time searches for the word cyber in NSF documents, you will see that it's exploded in the last 10 years. We go from about, you know, about 10 different citations 10 years ago, and for the most part was cybersecurity, to thousands and thousands in today's document. It's almost hard to get an NSF announcement that does not include the word cyber. Okay. So today's talk, uh, we'll talk about a little bit about evolutionary algorithms. We'll talk about non-Darwinian evolution. It is something that I worked on. And then you know we will apply them for source characterization problems. We are at NCAR, so I try to come up with a real atmospheric problem. Um, and then you know we will use three different data sets. Uh, the prairie graphs you know, from the 50s, I think it's 57. Uh, the dipole 26 from the 80s. And then a real accident, Fukushima in you know, 2011. OK, so source characterization. Typical scenario, there is a source that is unknown to us. And some sensors on the ground, in air, maybe from space, they detect potentially toxic gas. Our objective, we want to determine the characteristics as far as location, how large it was, was it single or multiple, static dynamics, and so on. And the only tools we have are the measurements at the sensors. So let's assume there are sensors on the ground some transport and dispersion models, and then machine learning. So let's start with a very simple um, dispersion model. This is a simple uh, Gaussian plume model. Uh, we used um, uh, Briggs equation for uh, you know, the um, model in the atmospheric stability. And those are our known variables, you know, the location, um, the size, the emission rate, and the wind direction. So in this particular case, um, I assume that I didn't know the wind direction. That is because it's usually one of the hardest uh, to know me um, measurements on the field at a high resolution. So those are the atmospheric classes you know, from A to F. Um, and those are simulated using uh, data collected at the time of the experiment. So those are um, real. And I start with a synthetic case. So this is you know, uh, just to make sure that our methodology worked because um, at this time, I wasn't really sure how to evaluate my results. So I created a very simple um, synthetic case. Um, it's right here. I put sensors all over the domain. And then you know, I added some noise, no noise, fixed wind direction. And the first thing you know, that I tried to do is try to understand how to evaluate simulations with observations. So I make a collection of different functions that were used in the, um, in the literatures. Um, you know, some are very uh, simple, you know, some are in logarithmic scale, uh, some are uh, linear scale. Um, some, you know, this is the fraction of bias only uh, measure concentrations, you know, the bar means it's an average, so, you know, we do not do point-wise point um, uh, comparisons. We have different normalizations. Um, and, you know, we came up with something like this. So those are uh, the first... Um, and as far as, as I know, it's probably the first time that those were uh, published. It really gives you the landscape, you know? And the reason why this is important is because if you use stochastic algorithms that are based on a convergence, this gives you, you know, your rate of convergence, how fast, you know, you can expect to converge. And what we can learn is that, you know, some are very similar, you know, like this one and that one, they look almost the same. Um, some, you know, they have very narrow reach, so, you know, you can imagine that, you know, they will converge very fast as long as you get nearby the solutions. Some is the fractional bias, they don't have, you know, the actual solution. Uh, by the way, I should have mentioned, you know, the solution was right here, you know, as you can see. In here, you see, we just have a reach. You know, we don't, you know, we cannot pinpoint it. Yeah. Um, so, that was in, uh, important, and uh, what I st uh, end up using for most of my work are those AHY1, AHY2. This actually was a joke. Um, it, it, they came up on uh, two articles by Allen, Hung, and uh, uh, sorry, Hopped and Young. You know, Sue Allen, uh, Rahul was one of it, and uh, I mentioned it like this in my paper because you know they didn't really give it a name. And ever since, you know, they've been called, you know, AHY1 and 2. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I changed the word in a little bit. And that's how, by the way, I got involved in 
to NCAR. You know, I mean, I published this paper, and then one day I was at a conference, and Sue uh, came in and introduced herself to say, "Hey, you know, I'm the H in your uh, <laughs> in your function." Okay, so that was an important step because you know I really had to figure out you know what function to use in order to evaluate. Now that I know how to evaluate, I know how to simulate, I use you know, a, a, a simple model, I can try to attempt to do a real optimization. So we start with those uh, evolutionary algorithms. Um, just sorry, a show of hands, um, how many of you have never heard of evolutionary algorithms or genetic algorithms? OK, just one. Okay. So I'll, um, I'll, I'll go over a little quickly, but you know we can talk maybe after. Um, so, First of all, when we talk about genetic algorithms, don't think about biology. Those are computational algorithms that are just inspired by biological evolution. And you know, this is the oldest quote you will find in this presentation. Uh, and this is you know, the premise for those computational algorithms, is that you, know, you try a candidate solution, then you apply some changes, and then you evaluate uh, this new solution. And then you know you put it together with a population solution, and then you know some survive into the next iteration, some die. So they are inspired by evolutionary um, processes, but they're very, they're grossly, um, you know, simplification. Okay. So the Darwinian operator. So as I said, you know, we generate an individuals, and then you know we apply some changes. Those changes. Um, are uh, usually called mutation and recombination. And uh, the way it works is that you know, we have a problem, in this case, of six variables. Each variable is one of the, um, the variables in our problem. We generate a population of those at random. And then you know, we select some according to some criterion. We apply those mutations or recombination. We evaluate it, put it back into the pool. And then you know, we have a survival selection, which shows who will survive. And over time, those will converge toward a solution. It doesn't mean it is the best solution. That's why those are stochastic. We usually iterate about 30 times or so. Uh, but as uh, it has been said in the literature, evolutionary algorithms usually are the second best way to solve a problem. The first is to really analyze it, spending quite a bit of time to find an analytical solution or numerical solution. In the second one, it just tries stochastically hundreds of times, and usually, you know, they find a good solution. So, and one thing I want to point, because you know, this will help you understand the second part. This evolution is a process of trial and error. So, this is a typical flowchart. We start, we initialize a population purely at random. So, we have the six variable. We assign random values within certain uh, within a certain uh, ranges. Um, population usually size 50 or size 100. Then uh, in this Darwinian, we select the parents. You know, it could be random or it could be according to how fit to are to the problem. We mutate them or recombine them. Then you know, we evaluate them. This is usually very time consuming. It means you know, running an atmospheric model, the transport and dispersion process. And then you know, you, uh, your survival selection. Different ways, you know, uh, to tra the most traditional ways are, you know, to take, you know, the old population, the new population, put it into one big um, uh, array, sort it according to the fitness, and then you truncate. Or, uh, but this is very greedy. So another method that is usually used is that you put everything into a pool, and then iteratively you pick up to a random, you know, the one that has, you know, the highest fitness then survive, the other one dies, so that you, know, you give a chance also to some of the least feed to survive into the next uh, iteration. Adjust parameters, termination. Uh, termination, usually it's time, you know, like 10 minutes, or certain number of uh, exhaustion or computational resources, or if you reach a threshold, like you know, if you find a solution within a few meters. So for this case, I use real data. Remember, before it was just synthetic case. Here is real data. This is you know, the prairie, uh, prairie grass experiment. Um, if I remember correct, this from the, oh yeah, 58 uh, releases of SO2. You know, EPA uh, didn't really uh, exist at that time. It's almost like today, right? And um, <laughs> there are 68 continuous releases. And um, all the releases were here at the center. And this concentration of SO2 were measure a concentric arc at different distance from the center. And all stability cases were sampled at A to F that I showed you earlier. So um, apply this evolutionary algorithm that I showed you before. 
this is my solution. This is you know what I, what I reconstructed by using the observations taken at the time of the field. Sorry, the other way around. This is what I reconstructed using the observation in the field. This is the output of the model. So I say it worked really, really well. So it was able, you know, to find the direction. Remember, wind, wind direction was one of the um, was one of the attributes, uh, the variables. The other was location, uh, sword strength, so you know the contour line. So it did fairly well in most cases here. Now uh, we'll talk about this in a slide. Uh, this is uh, A, B, and C atmospheric class. This is D, E, and F. Um, did fairly well. And keep in mind one thing. Actually, those are harder than the previous one. Why? Because we have less data. The footprint is smaller. So in the previous one, you know, we have a larger amount of sensors, you know, that we are matching. So it's easier to compute the error. In this case, we have much less. So those are actually harder to optimize than the previous one. So what happened in this case? Um, so this is a plot of the concentration for the different arcs. So you see, I mean, they're getting smaller because the footprint gets smaller. Uh, the black is what is observed, and the red is what, uh, sorry, the dotted red is what the algorithm optimized. Um, so this is my solution, you know, what the algorithm thinks is the best solution. This is using, you know, the uh, parameter measure at the field. So what is happening is really, you know, there were three main wind directions during the time of experiments. I should have mentioned that this release is, uh, was over a period of 15 minutes. So what really happened is that, you know, the wind changed over three directions. And this simple Gaussian model I was using, it's assuming only one main direction. So you see, it actually did fairly well. I mean, you know, if you compute the errors, you know, this is a much best, better match than this. So what I went ahead and do, I perform a sensitivity study um, on the wind angles using the observed parameters and using, you know, uh, this is just a result uh, using a simulation. So as you can see that, you know, my theta of here about 100, you know, you know, going one direction is actually better than the one observed in the field just because of the characteristic and the modality of this particular experiment. But this is, you know, it triggered an interesting uh, problem about background knowledge. We're going to talk about it in a second. You see, those are two particular experiments. Uh, in the first one, it worked really, really well. You know, again, black is uh, what was observed. Red is what is simulated. Uh, this is reconstructed over space. You know, remember, this is logarithmic. So the fact that you see it in little larger, it's actually a rather small error because it's a logarithmic scale. And here, in this case, it's actually really bad. You know? But remember that it's really bad just because you know we're off by angle by a few degrees, you know, about 10 degrees. You see, other than that, you know, the, the source location was actually identified correctly. The strength you know, was pretty much good. Um, yeah, maybe you know, here is a little larger than there. But you know, for the most part, it did really good, except for this wind speed. So what this means is that this particular model is extremely sensitive to wind speed. So here. It's one dilemma that we have. You see, if we do not know the wind direction, you know, we just uh, tell the algorithm to find it. It's, you know, it's just any other variables. When we know it, uh, then you know we just use it. But what about this case? You know, when we know it, but we are highly uncertain. So, in other words, I know that the wind was more or less coming from that direction. Not sure if it was exactly there, was there or there. So you know, I know it with an uncertainty. This is the type of background knowledge that I was telling you before. We know something about it, but it's not just a number. You know, it's hard to add it into into the system. So here, um, with our, um, co some collaborators, we decided to use this methodology called dynamic time warping. You know, it sounds like something from Star Trek, but it isn't. <laughs> it's very easy. You know, normally, if you have two time series, like in this case, you know, they are isomorphous, you know, they look similar. But as you can see, you know, one of the axes is a little bit shifted. Now, if you're assuming that, you know, this x-axis, you know, it's usually done for time series. That's why it's called dynamic time warping. But, you know, we can apply to any, um, any variable on the, on the uh, this order, no, or the abscissa. Um, you see, if we're just assuming that you know this time or this x-axis is consistent, then you know we have a very large error. 
But if we allow you know, the x-axis to be elastic, you know, to contract and expand you know, within you know, a certain search space, then you know, we can actually find you know, a very good match. So what we basically are saying that you know, in this particular point, you know, the x-axis has been contracted, and here it's been expanded. It's almost like thinking you know, of different sampling rate you know, from an instrument. And the reason why this is very cool is because this can be solved with dynamic programming. You know, probably many of you are computer scientists. So it's extremely fast. You know, as long as you give it a window that is not too large, you can find it. This optimized walk, you know, in which you know you're trying to match, you know, one point on the x-axis and several points on this other x-axis, is very efficient. And what was beautiful about this is that when we apply to our uh, optimization problem. On the x-axis, I have wind angle, so I'm doing a sensitivity on the wind angle. And here, I have an error. I'm using you know, our you know, AHY, you know, that logarithmic function, and then the equivalent in non-logarithmic scale. And this is the case where the algorithm did very well, because um, the wind angle that the simulation was pretty much consistent with what was observed in the field. That's the one that was off by a few degrees. So as you can see, you know, both methods, regardless if it's logarithmic or uh, normal scale, you know, as you start deviating, you know, the error grows very much because you know, the sensor will not match anymore. Whereas with this dynamic time warping, for almost 20 degrees, is able you know, to find the same error. So it's almost like saying to the algorithm, look, you know, the wind comes from there, plus or minus 10 degrees, and you will still find the minimum. Yeah. Most important, it did the same here. You know, where we were off. So you see, that was one way that you know we found to add this background knowledge into our, our learning process. Yeah. Now, and I'm going to speed up here <laughs> a little bit. So it worked really well, but really, I know I'm not fooling you. That was a simple problem. You know, there was just one source. You know, it was a flat terrain. There were you know all those um, concentric um, sensors. Now, what about if we are going into the real world where you know, we have a complex terrain where we cannot use a Gaussian, we have to use a Lagrangian transport and dispersion. We might even have to run some uh, an atmospheric model to build you know, a 3D field because it's a complex terrain. Well, then it becomes extremely, extremely complex. This evaluation that I told you is crucial because we are running it you know, hundreds, maybe thousands of times. It's extremely time consuming. So what we really need to do, we need to reduce this number of function evaluation. And what I told you earlier is that, well, these evolutionary algorithms, they're really random processes. You know, they're trial and error processes, just purely driven by randomness. What about if we can add a little bit of intelligence? And this is what you know, I call the non-Darwinian evolution. You see, on the right is what I described to you before. On the left, we have a different method. So let's walk through it. We initialize the population is the same, starting at random where all the variables are initialized within a certain, um, certain ranges. And then we select those H and L groups. So what those are high performance and low performance group. We find some solutions that are most fit to the problem, some solutions that are less fit. And then we run a machine learning process. This is just a pure classification in which we try to find generalization that describe why certain individuals, those H group, are outperforming the L group. We are adding a reasoning process. And then after we do that, we instantiate those rules so that the new individuals are just generated within this subspace that has been identified as containing, more likely containing the solution because there are generalization of the positive versus the negative. Purely classification process. And then the rest is the same. And we can kind of switch between the two. Why switch? Well, you know, this is, tends to be very greedy. This tends to be, you know, like a little bit more explorative. So by switching between the two, then, you know, we can have, you know, this fast convergence of the intelligence and, you know, this evolutionary uh, search um, that is, um, you know, more inclusive. One way to view about it is a progressive partitioning of the space. Instead of having, you know, those points, you know, that they move, you know, pseudo randomly converging towards solution. You think that you know at every iteration we're reducing the space, we're making the problem simpler. Okay, so <coughs> very simple problem. This is I'm just going to illustrate a simple problem so that we make sure that everyone understands, and then I'm going to show you how it works in the real world. 
Um, this is a four-dimensional problem. I thought to make it a little bit more interesting and more confusing for you to see. I have two variables on this axis, two variables on this axis. Here, I had to discretize them in order to show them to you. Um, and the solution is here, is the blue. This is my solution. So what this means is that x1 is equals to 3, x2 is equals to 3, x3 is equals to 3, and x4 to make it simple, is also equals to 3. So everything must be equals to 3. Remember, this is discretized. So 3 means you know, between a certain range and a certain range. This is longitude, latitude, uh, wind direction, and size. Just a four-dimensional um, source characteristic problem. What you have here in brown are our candidate solution, our initial randomized solution. Those are the ones that you know we started purely at random and we evaluate them. So what happens here on the left, we have our standard evolutionary strategy, and there the non-Darwinian. I circled in green instead of in blue. I thought it was cooler, um, you know, like a target, right? A circle. You know, that's the solution we're trying to find out. We start. They are identical, OK? Let's see one iteration, what is happening. Here, nothing yet. In here, each one of those candidate solutions was evaluated, so it means we run the transport and dispersion process for it, and we compare what we simulate with the observed solutions at the sensors. And we divide them into high and low. Now, notice that not everything is partitioned. You know, like for example, this point right here, it's neither good or bad. So those that, you know, uh, we only take the one that are most fit and least fit, you know, in order to have more discriminatory power. We run a machine learning uh, rule. So this is, uh, remember, what a machine learning rule is a generalization of the positive with this respect to the negative. So what this means, that this graph will include all the positives, which are right now in red. Those are the intersection. And it will exclude all of the bad ones. I can just uh, go back one second so that you can see all those that are red are outside of this area. So this is the idea that you know we have generalized the space to the maximum without including the ones that we know are bad. Um, this is just to show you the quality of the rules. It's a, it's a metric. And this is the new iteration. You see they both moved. This just purely from random. All those new individuals are within the bluer area. So you know we made the problem smaller. Let's go to another iteration again. Different rules, five rules in this case, how they match their quality, my new population, you see? So they're both converging. Look at that, you know, they intersected our solution. So we have converged, and then, you know, this one eventually will converge. It found the solution, and after a while, the entire population converged. So what to take out of it? So, so the solution is the same. You know, we get the same solution. We just got to it faster. Now, one, uh, you know, no free lunch theorem. This is very simple, you know, you're just changing a variable using a Gaussian distribution. Here you're running a machine learning process. So is this always better? No. This is only good if your evaluation takes longer than running a machine learning process. Right? There is a trade-off between discovering rules and evaluating the individual. So for hard problems, this is good. For simple problems, no. OK, so results. We use every single one of those prairie grass cases. And uh, we repeat each experiment 30 times. Um, and, um, and this is you know, what we get. You know, for the atmospheric class F, we get a larger error. That is because I told you before, as the footprint is smaller, it's harder to converge. For the other ones, we do very well. And rather than using hundreds of sensors, you know, we took a random two sensors, three sensors, you know, up until 20 sensors. You know, usually, we had about a few hundreds. Just to make it more interesting, you know, in real life we hardly get you know those hundreds of sensors. So we saw this very fast convergence. Um, we tried every single one of those 68 experiments. You know, here the color code is the atmospheric class, and um, we tried using you know the real data, uh, which would be the darker one with the observed, and then synthetic. So what I did, I just picked up you know whatever measurements were observed in the field. I constructed you know like a simulation for that so just in purely simulated space and this is you know the difference between this is just basically you know how accurately the um, the sensors and the meteorology was captured at the time of the experiments but you know you see that the pattern is very similar and everything is doing very well the only ones again that they're not doing too well 
are those f, just because you know we have so little data. Well, uh, this actually I'm very proud of this graph. Those are literally thousands and thousands of simulations. I have done that using um, Yellowstone. Each one of these is the is the average of 30 runs. And we have done different experiments for different atmospheric classes. And what we are showing here that no matter how many sensors we have, okay, whether we take three sensors up to, uh, to 12 sensors, in one axis we have the cumulative concentration, so how much concentration those combination of sensors get versus the error. So what this means is that you know we have a very good an um, analytical functions in which tell me what concentration you have measured, I will tell you what is the expected error. So what this means is that you know you can either give me a couple of sensors right along you know, the center line where we have the highest concentration, you can give me some sensors, more sensors at the periphery, I will I have the same expected error. And this is very important you know, for designing an experiment and deciding where you put your sensors. Okay, so now that I have this very good algorithm, it's fast, it runs, uh, it runs well, I can try a real problem. So this is a prairie grass experiment. This was in the 80s. Um, and this is you know, our source. Uh, and then you know, here we have three um, lines of sensor, here, here, and here. Um, we have different surface uh, stations, and then you know, we have a vertical profile, a balloon that you know, was sent at different times. The goal is to identify the characteristics of the source. And uh, this is um, this is a I, I use ski path for this particular problem. It's a Lagrangian path of transport and dispersion problem. I use the real meteorology measure at the time of the experiments. This is a reconstruction of the plume using the meteorological data collected at the experiment. So this is this is pretty much, you know the best you know that I can simulate you know this is my solution okay and what you see here is over time uh, the concentration measured by the three lines of sensors you know green are the first sensor red is the second line blue are the third line so you can see that you know the storm as time goes you know the, um, the release is given they start measuring then you know it goes down then the second line of sensor get the sent the measurement then the blue one this is the real data collected every 15 minutes, and this is simulated every, uh, I forgot, a few seconds. Um, so you know, um, you know, they're doing OK. So you know, what they simulate over there, it is consistent with what measure at the time of the experiment. Um, this is just a different visualization. Uh, in here, we have time. Here, we have you know, the first 30 sensor, second 30 sensor, 30 second sensor. So basically you see the plume that is expanding over time and space. You know, it's hard to do it not with a video. That's the best way I could think of. Simulated using you know the 15 minutes interval data collected at the time of the experiment. So we're doing okay. This is what just to check whether or not we can even attempt simulating this. We run that non-Darwinian uh, evolution. Those are you know our results. And if you have a little bit of memory with what we saw before, you know, they actually look really similar. And we tried all different combinations. In, uh, in this one, for example, we have removed all but one surface, or maybe, sorry, two surface observations. And in that one, uh, we removed sensors at random. So instead of using 90 sensors, we just used 15 sensors. Uh, picked at random along you know those three lines. Mm -hmm. So we did all those different experiments, and you know I'm just showing you some results. Of course, I'm showing you the best results, but you know everything you know was rather s similar. So no matter what sensor we removed, no matter what surface observation we removed, as long as we have a minimum amount, then you know we were able to reconstruct. And this is a real problem. We were running a real transport and dispersion simulation. Now, in the last five minutes, um, I'm going to show you how we've applied this for the Fukushima accident. Um, <coughs> this is something that it was um, um, I work on um, right when this happened. Uh, back in those days, I was at George Mason University. One of my students who had just graduated uh, was working for USGS. There is something called International Charter for um, Disasters. It's an organization of all uh, countries that have space observation capabilities. On behalf of the Japanese government, this was activated, was coordinated by DLR, the German Space Agency. And you know, the goal was to 
analyze remote sensing data and make maps for the damage um, of the time of the experiment. So this is you know the, uh, what, what I, I I did this within a um, few hours of uh, you know the explosion of the 14th. I see this is on the 19th, so I must have done it on the 19th. Um, and you can see this is you know the uh, Fukushima nuclear power plant, you know, those are the reactor, you see that, you know, reactor four and three, and two, sorry, the, the containment vessel has been completely breached. Um, one, you know, has some um, uh, debris, you know, three is the only one that is intact. Just a few days earlier, you can see that it was perfectly fine. Actually got a very nice thank you letter from USGS for doing this. And uh, the problem here was a little bit different because here we know the source location. What we don't know is how high it was. So we have you know, sensors on the ground. Um, this is an array that was maintained by the Japanese government you know, for uh, nuclear um, accidents. Uh, this is questions. I know. Uh, this is how the data looks like. So you can see everything is fine. Oof, you know, we have you know, peak, you know, the first release, and then the second release, and then you know, we have you know, this slow decay. And the problem is, well, you know, can we model it? And I pose it as um, as an optimization problem. So we are trying to reconstruct the concentration at each one of those sensors that I showed you uh, around Japan at different times. Okay, so one way um, to view it is that we are optimizing, we're we are finding basically a set of scalars that we multiply for each location, um, a time and space, and then we uh, we subtract, you know, with what is observed. Um, let me show you a little bit. I think with this figure, it's a little bit more clear. We have one release, and we simulate this release by being made of a number of um, separate releases. And we start with a concentration Q, with a fixed concentration Q. If we simulate this, then you know we will have a certain number of concentrations all over those other locations. We sum them up, and then you know we can scale them. Now, once we do that, we can find this optimal scalar in time, so that you know this release it is scaled, and we minimize the error of what is measured at all those different locations. So it's a it's an optimization problem, is space and time. And to do this again, I use Skipper. So this is um, I, each simulation is a, uh, sorry each release is a different color. The reason why I have to do you know different releases because at the concent when I simulate at the concentration I need to know what what is you know the contribution of each of those releases so that you know I can optimize them. So this is you know my fixed Q you know to the power eight nanogram per hours. Those are the different releases uh, for five days from the 14th to the 19th. Um, um, sorry, it's four days, um, all the 14th, all the way to the 19th. Um, no, sorry, five days, I can't count right now. Um, <laughs> and, you know, um, so if we generate that, we obtain this. So, you know, this is the different concentration measure of one of the stations. We had, you know, 15th, I'm just showing you one. And this is what I get with this constant release. This is, you know, what was observed. Now, my goal is to find scalars so that I can multiply this, so that those, you know, will also rescale. We assume that there is a linear relationship between source and what is observed, and we have to do this in parallel across all the different locations. Once I do that, I obtain this, and this. So those are my scalar. I basically I take the scalar, multiply by this, and I get you know my two large releases, and then you know this continuous leak. Now, this I've done it um, back in 2011 within a few days of the explosion. So my estimate is to the power 10. The official estimate is to the power 8. It's many times in life, you know, the truth is in between. So you know, right now, you know, the best estimate is that those were something to the power nine. Now keep in mind that this was done rather quickly using only a you know, limited amount of observations. And the thing that I didn't have are the meteorology. You know, I, I haven't done that. If anybody wants to do it, I would love to work with you. I'm really sure that this methodology will work much better if I have better meteorology. I just use, you know, I didn't use any models. I just use surface measurements made at those airports uh, that I showed you before. So. 
Once I do that, this is you know my simulations. You know now that I have you know the source strength, I can actually simulate. And you see all the contamination over over the ground is because you know we have the wind that change around just for a few hours. On I think it's the 17. So this is you know the official data that was measured. I'll just show you some of the newest research, and I will stop in about two minutes. Uh, this is, you know, the measurements that were made by a joint mission from Japan and the U.S. Um, it was planned by uh, airplane and helicopters. That's why, you know, you have these regular patterns. This is what, um, it's the graded values. This was, uh, and this is, you know, the background radiation normally occurring in Japan. And this is the convex hole that describes all those um, observations that were made. Once I subtract them, this is, you know, the footprints of the plume. Um, which is believed that was generated, you know, from the release. Uh, here, you know, I put it over a DM so that you can see how actually here it follows the valley. I mean, the reason why it makes, you know, this, uh, this bend. Mm -hmm. Now, what happened is that, you know, in the immediate aftermath, not much data was released to the general public. General public, you know, was rather concerned. Um, there was an exclusion zone of uh, first 15 kilometers, then, you know, it went to 30 kilometers. I think now it's 20. And in the immediate aftermath, a group of people put together, you know, very simple, inexpensive uh, Geiger counter. Those are, you know, the Bluetooth connection, GPS connection. And uh, there are about, you know, 20,000 of those little devices, you know, around the world. And there are about 70 million observations that have been made from 2011 wow. until now. And one of the questions is, well, you know, are they any good? So I wrote a grant for the uh, Office of Naval Research to try to evaluate those data. Uh, this is the density. Uh, and keep in mind, I'm just showing you over this area, but we have data all over the world. Um, you can find it for Boulder too. I collected it and I uploaded <laughs> it. So uh, we have, you know, from some location, hundreds of thousands of measurements, some less visited location, just a few tens. And this is, you know, over time, you see there was a peak in 2013, you know, now the interest is a little bit decreasing. Everything that is, you know, those colors, it's not very, it's basically background. Everything that is above, especially the dark green, is rather dangerous. However, when you plot the DOE with a safe cast, you know, it shows that, you know, safe cast is grossly overestimating it. Now, the people at safe cast, they say that, you know, those are not real. Uh, well, you know, there is some argument over there. Um, my approach was, well, you know, whether they're here or not is a little bit inconsequential because, you know, decision makings are made on those data. So if somehow I can approximate this distribution from that distribution, that means that I can take the safecast data, put it in the decision support tool, hoping that the decision support tools already takes into account uh, different values. So, in order to do that, I had to take care of a little bit of a decay because, you know, uh, whereas, you know, the official data was just collected at the time of the accident, the safecast data has been collected since the accident. So, you know, if we take a data today, we cannot really compare it with the data of 2011. We have to decay. You know, we have to take into account the normal uh, loss of radiation. It's a, actually a very simple function. And what I want to show you, uh, if it works, it's always hard to... It's always risky to show this stuff in okay, right here. So this is, you know, before, what you're seeing here is the data coming in is in logarithmic time. So we go from a few seconds all the way, you know, to uh, years. Um, what you see there, uh, that is the maximum value measured by the Department of Energy as a function of time. So in a perfect world, no peak here should be higher than that. This is the maximum of the official data. This is the safecast data. Those are the two distributions plotted against each other after I grid them. And this is over space. You see here data keeps coming in and decaying. Here the data just decays because it was collected only once. And the data all goes over there because it's decaying over time. So as I told you, it's overestimating. Um, we, we performed here uh, different um, compensation over time. Uh, so this is a multiple linear uh, fit that we did between the two data sets. We find that there is a quadratic relationship between the two. And after we uh, do that, we can calibrate it. So we take the initial measurement from SafeCast. It's right here. Uh, we multiply by a slope. We add the intersect, calculated for the same time step. Then we decayed. And then you know we get uh, the new, uh, our new data. And just to be amazed, this is, you know, after calibration. 
Mm. And you see, we are actually doing really well, both space, time, and so on. So this was a major success because we can take the citizen's science data, applied some simple calibration, and actually using in view of official data. Mm. So I'm done. Uh, so lessons learned. So we talked about some um, source characterization using evolutionary algorithms. We extended into this non-Darwinian domain for those hard problems where the computation is much uh, more complicated. Um, it's very important to optimize those computational resources. Um, and this non-Darwinian methodology can do that. You know, it can actually help you reduce the number of computations. And then I hope you know that I convinced that this is important, especially you know, if you come from a physics background, you're probably, you know, you're driven by the principles, you know, you always find you know, your own equations. It's almost like, you know, like uh, it is a very bad, you know, to look at the equation in the book, you have to redefine it. Well, you know, this is a completely different way of thinking. You know, we just start from the data rather than starting from the principles. My last slide, I do want to accomplish, uh, sorry, to uh, acknowledge, you know, those are my postdoc and my students. <laughs> several of them have worked on several of the problems that I discussed today. Thank you. I'm done. <laughs>